All right, so groundwater hydrology. And our learning objectives are first to explore the quantity, movement, and storage of water below the ground. And then we'll discuss fundamental concepts related to groundwater hydrology and hydraulics. And so I guess the first distinction we need to make is what's the difference between groundwater hydrology and hydraulics? Um, hydrology refers to where the water is and kind of how it moves through the landscape. And then hydraulics is specific calculations that we do to figure out how much you can pump out of an aquifer, how far the groundwater level is gonna draw down, that sort of thing. So the big question of the day is what is groundwater? Groundwater can be shallow, it can be deep, it can move relatively quickly, or it can take thousands of years to move from one point to another. Here's a cross section of a landscape and it looks at different flow paths that groundwater can take. And these are actually common to the Rocky Mountains where you have a mountain area snow melt rain and there's different layers or strata in the bedrock and different deposits that exist and so you know if you ever took geology you know that mountains get pushed up slowly over millions of years and layers that might have been horizontal become diagonal or even vertical and these layers have different permeabilities and in some cases groundwater can flow through some of those layers and make its way down to a valley bottom um, somewhere downhill or down slope. That's gonna be a really long-term pathway, maybe years or tens or hundreds or thousands of years that water can take to move. We also have shallow pathways where water can um, enter the grounds and maybe this is um, an area that's been glaciated, it's got a lot of lakes and so the sediment is gravel and sand and that sort of thing. And water can move relatively quickly from an upslope area to a downslope area. We also have groundwater that can move in and out of river systems. And so we'll talk about different ways that rivers either collect or contribute to the groundwater system. And then finally, we've got um, different pathways that result in water entering into bigger water bodies like a lake, an ocean, kind of a terminal source, essentially. So the big picture here is that the deeper flow paths are slower flow paths and shallower flow paths are faster. We talked about soil water in, in the last month or so, and that's the interface between, in this case, um, groundwater and the soil. And so we're gonna be talking a lot about this water table and that's the, the zone where water is, uh, the soil is saturated. And so you have a saturated zone and an unsaturated zone. And this is a um, different, certain kind of aquifer that's unconfined, meaning it's not pressurized or anything like that. This is all an area that water can, if the water table goes up, it can rise up. Water table goes down, it can go down. Um, so we're, we're talking about the saturated groundwater zone where water, um, where the soil is, is completely saturated below the capillary fringe. Uh, a really important term, you no doubt have heard it as aquifer. I uh, had a friend that called it aquaphor. Aquaphor is a uh, lotion for, <laughs> for really dry skin. Um, this is an aquifer. An aquifer can really be any material, any medium that can store water. So it could be, um, in this case, just sand or gravel, right? Just soil. Um, we could have a confining layer that might be clay. And we know that clay can contain water, but water doesn't really flow through clay very well. And so this might be uh, confining or a thing that basically limits effectively water flow. So we can have very many layers to an aquifer. Carrie was um, walking out in the Lunch Loops area and there's a house out there near the Miramani Trailhead that's got a well and it's out on one of those, you know, kind of mesas that's just all limestone and stuff. And she struck up a conversation with the woman and she's like, how deep's your well? And the woman said, 900 feet. <laughs> and she's like, holy crap. Um, I'd love to see the well log for that thing because how many different layers are you going through to get down to this 
fresh water source in the middle of the desert. Um, so no doubt she's gone through some different, you know, the Morrison formation, right? That's kind of clay. Uh, maybe there's some different limestone or um, gran granitic um, uh, features, geologic features that have different kinds of water in them. Um, so it could be a sandstone layer that has cracks in it and the water goes through the cracks, that sort of thing. This can all be different kinds of aquifers. When you have confined aquifers, you have the potential for pressure to exist. And you tap into that. Um, in this woman's case, it was a confined aquifer. Her water, her well was 900 feet deep. That's how far they had to go to get to the water. The water level in her well is only, I think she said 50 feet down. And so there's pressure that's pushing that water up so that um, it's overcoming the gravity. You know, um, there's, there's enough pressure to push it up that high, hundreds of feet high. It's a wild, it's a wild well, 900 feet. Um, so let's just talk about some more fundamental concepts and that's what we're introducing today is these big concepts. I drew a lot of these pictures when we talked about water runoff and infiltration. You've got surface water, typically the um, water table. And when we, when we talk about water table, we're talking about the near surface shallow aquifer. That's the aquifer that's just in the soil that's around us. You dig down here, you're gonna hit a water table. I don't know how deep it is. I don't know if you wanna drink it, right? But there's a water table there and that's influenced by the rain and irrigation and all that that happens. Any creek nearby is gonna intersect that water table and that creek running at base flow is supplied by this, this saturated zone or the, or the groundwater table, the shallow aquifer. So saturated zone, unsaturated zone. We can think about this a little more regionally where we have a creek or a river. That river exists in what's called alluvium. Does anyone know what alluvium is? Alluvial aquifer, have you heard that term before? Did you? And it's right there, it's so fresh. <laughs> It's so fresh. <laughs> we did. Oh, alluvial fan. And so alluvial fan is sediment that's been deposited by alluvial processes. It just means water. It means water carried the sediment and put it here. And so an alluvial valley is a valley that's made up of sediment carried by the river. Point bars, you know, floods, floodplain deposits. Um, you know, over thousands of years. All the gravel ponds that you see along rivers, they're mining alluvial sediment. They're mining gravel, cobble, sand that the river has brought down from above. And, you know, it deposited over here on this side of the floodplain, then it moved over here over hundreds of years and left all that sediment that people come back and mine. So the alluvial aquifer is one thing, and you can imagine that all that stuff's really porous and water can flow pretty quickly through it. Um, but that and there's a water table in that area. But more regionally, you've got upland areas, maybe you've got mountains. And so you've got groundwater moving slowly down um, from other areas that's coming down into this alluvial aquifer. And they're all connected just at different time scales. You can have different areas that are recharge zones. This is an important concept and discharge zones. And so what this is showing is uh, a recharge area up in the hill slopes where snow is melting and that water goes down into the ground and recharges these aquifers. And then you might have discharge zones at the toes of hill slopes, springs or seep areas um, or river systems where the groundwater is discharging and coming out of groundwater and going into surface water. The groundwater uh, is a reservoir, right? And when we talked about that first lecture in class way, way back when, uh, three years ago when the semester started, that um, groundwater is an important component of the water balance and systems. And so um, if you think about glaciers have the most fresh water in our planet, groundwater comes next, and then lakes and reservoirs and, and uh, rivers come next, much smaller amount though. Um, the recharge rate on average for the groundwater system is about 300 years. Some systems recharge on an annual scale. Some systems recharge over thousands of years. 
Have you guys heard of the term fossil water? It's like fossil fuels. So a fossil water is a, is a source of water that people tap into and deplete, and it's not being recharged. There's no source that's recharging it. So an example of fossil water is out in the um, Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabia, these, are these areas where it's all desert, but they've drilled down in some cases thousands of feet to tap into ancient lakes, stuff that um, existed, you know, when continents had different shapes, right? So maybe the water was stored there millions of years ago. They tapped into it, it's no longer connected to the surface. Like fossil fuels, right? We're not generating more fossil fuels. I guess maybe, I guess in some areas, there's some old dinosaur bones that are still baking, you know? But the idea of fossil water is that there's no rate of exchange. Um, so that's on one extreme. The Ogallala Aquifer, which we'll talk about, this is in the Great Plains, uh, part of it's in Colorado. It's an aquifer that's really deep and the recharge rate there occurs over tens to hundreds of years. And so the agricultural producers that are tapping it with their wells are, are drawing, it, drawing it down faster than it's recharging. We'll talk about that in a minute. So this, uh, the idea of rate of exchange and how fast groundwater is replenished is really important. If we look at a cross section, and a well, and we're gonna look at a lot of these kinds of cross sections with pumping wells in the next lecture. Um, we can look at flow lines. And you guys have flow lines for geotech, right? Flow nets. Um, the idea of a flow line is, is you've got certainly, um, there's kind of that equipotential or the um, hydraulic head associated with that. We also have timelines associated with that. And the deeper you go and the longer the flow line, the longer it takes for water to move from point A to point B. Um, so a really shallow flow line is going to have potentially a, a time a flow rate of days to years. And the deeper we go, maybe it'll take a century or many or tens of years for water to get from here into this aquifer and back out downstream somewhere. So one thing we're going to talk about and do some calculations, this is uh, kind of the classic FE groundwater problem is this cone of depression. So you've got a water table, you've got a well, you're pumping that well, so discharge is coming out and it's gonna draw that water table down into the well to where this kind of steady state water surface is. Um, so we'll look at how this happens in unconfined settings and then confined settings as well. Note that you could also be potentially drawing water from the stream. Before this well, maybe the flow path went from the land to the stream and recharged the stream. In this case, you're pumping in a way where now the gradient is going back towards the well and you're actually drawing water from the stream. What could be a problem with that? Cancer, yeah. Right, so you could have a water rights problem. And that actually plays out to this day on the Arkansas Basin and the South Flat Basin. Those are big alluvial aquifers where those rivers are in the front range. And people put their wells in and started pumping and they're like, free water. And then the people, all of a sudden, the stream flows started going down, downstream and people were like, uh-uh, that ain't free, that's my water that you're pumping. And so you can imagine there was a lot of money and lawsuits, a lot of groundwater modeling. It's really tough to model um, to figure out what you're pumping, how does that affect this stream over here? The other thing is if you're gonna put in a domestic well and you wanna drink this water or a municipal well, you wanna make sure that you're not getting that. So we don't, want to, we don't want that surface water. When you pump groundwater, typically you're not treating it. You're assuming that it's safe to drink. Not all the time, but you know, for a domestic well, you're typically not treating it. So um, you wanna make sure you don't have that surface connection. And if you're pumping so much that all of a sudden you're getting surface water, you don't drink water out of creeks, but you can drink water in the groundwater in, most, in many cases. So it could be a water quality situation there. 
So groundwater can change in time and space. And if you think about a season, you might have a situation where um, in one season, the groundwater table is high and the relative to the water level. So maybe the stream's flowing at base flow and um, the stream could be gaining. This idea of a gaining stream is that the stream's getting water supplemented from the groundwater. In most streams, when they're running at base flow, there's no surface runoff. It's really that water table that's, that's um, allowing those streams to have water in them. But you might have a situation where the water table is below the surface of the stream, in which case the, the stream is losing and the stream is actually recharging the aquifer. This often happens when you have irrigation ditches. You take water out of a river, you put it in a ditch. If the ditch is unlined, you're basically got water being carried across the landscape well above the water table. And so those ditches will often lose water and contribute to a local water table that supports springs and wetlands and all these things. As people line ditches more, you, you lose that connection. And there's a lot of reasons you might wanna do that. A, you don't wanna lose the water. B, here, when you have this losing condition from irrigation ditches, you're leaching selenium and other toxic chemicals out of the um, soil here. That soil content in the Mako Shale has high selenium concentrations. A lot of that is from irrigation all around and those irrigation ditches. Yeah, um, so that's a problem. Yeah, that's why we have a drainage district that went out and cut all these like 10 foot deep ditches to drain drain the water. They wanted to create a gaining stream. Yeah, and that might be Bureau of Reclamation money. That might be just money that they raised for the irrigation district. Might be connected to the water quality because we got a big selenium problem. Um, you could also have this, this temporal thing where you have during high flows, the river comes up and water enters into the banks and kind of the near floodplain area. And then during low flows, that water comes back out. And so you get this kind of short-term seasonal exchange between the river and the water table. This is just another look at that. Normal flow conditions, the water table is contributing to the base flow. The flood comes up, we start to get a reverse. There's more head here than there is here. And so there's a, a reverse gradient. And then um, even if you get a whole floodplain inundation, you can actually get a lot more storage in the bank. And you can imagine during, if you have a really big floodplain and you're able to store this water in the, in the floodplain in the banks, that during the low flow season, this water could leak back out and contribute to, to base flows in the river, which is a good thing. Let's look a little bit more about confined versus unconfined aquifers. Um, has anyone experienced or know about confined aquifers, also known as artesian aquifers or artesian wells? <laughs> yeah, so artesian springs. You know, it's really deep, fresh, clean water. That's an artesian well. Yeah, it doesn't have to guide, you know, here's a little, it's coming out of the ground like a fountain. Um, when we did hydraulics for hydraulics class, we looked at that hydraulic grade line and we noted that the further you go away, so say this is a water tank, um, an elevated water storage tank, the further away you go from that in the system, as water moves through the pipes, it's getting friction loss. And so the elevation that water would rise to that hydraulic grade line has a slope to it. And that's related to the friction loss in the system. The same thing works for confined aquifers. So we're up here in the mountains and the water table is really high in the mountains. The further you go down, you're gonna have this hydraulic grade line. And this is the line to which water would rise in a well. If the well happens to be below that line, you get flow coming out of the well. If the well is above that line, the water would rise to that level. And so that's what's going on with that woman's well. It rose 750 feet or 850 feet or whatever, um, which is pretty incredible. So the difference between a confined aquifer and an unconfined aquifer is there is a confined aquifer that's a low, a layer of bedrock. 
It could be bedrock, it could be clay, just some different strata that's more impermeable. And so it, what it ends up doing is, is allowing pressure to build up here. If this were sand, everything would mix and there wouldn't be a pressure. The only pressure gradient would just be the deeper you go, you get the weight of water, right? So you just get that um, hydraulic, uh, hydrostatic pressure. In this case, you're containing the pressure from up here, right? And so now this pressure is communicated over here because you have all this water sitting on top, creating pressure, kind of like a pipe. The way the confined aquifer works is you have to have this continuous confined layer for that pressure to be able to build up and transmit it far away. So it's just like a pipe. Yeah. Yeah. So then Mm -hmm. Because it right because you drilled down in there. Yeah, but it's not a flowing artesian well, but it's an artesian well. So the difference between an artesian well and a water table well is what, what's that threshold for that? Okay, so in this case, the water table is not confined, right? Yeah. So the pressure in this water is just the hydrostatic pressure. It's not gonna. There's no additional pressure that's gonna push it up against gravity. And so the water level in this well is equal to the, the elevation of the water table. In this case, the confined aquifer elevation at the top of it is here, but there's pressure, not just hydrostatic pressure, there's actual pressure in there. And so if you were to go down here and you know, put a tap on it and open that tap, water would flow up into the well until you get to this level. just for the confined aquifer, it starts up here. And it's the same thing if you were to have, um, if you think about the fire suppression system here, um, it's got to maintain 50 PSI or whatever it is on the third floor. Um, there's a limit to how high you can go and in each floor you go, that pressure reduces because you're getting closer and closer to this hydraulic grade line. If we were to go 10 stories, maybe our pressure would be zero and there would be no flow out of the pipes. Does that make sense? You turn the tap on and all of a sudden you get no flow. That's why you've got water tanks on top of tall, tall skyscrapers so they can actually have pressure in their buildings. Let's take a little bit of a look, kind of a magnifying glass or a microscope into an aquifer, the medium of the aquifer itself. Is it sand, gravel? Is it limestone, uh, fractured? Uh, uh, granites, that sort of thing. These, anything can, can be an aquifer and contain water. If we're thinking about soil and kind of unconsolidated things, things that aren't rock or bedrock, we have a porosity to it, right? And this is, these are this is a bit back to your basic geotech. You're looking at the void spaces um, when we talked about soil moisture earlier. This is the same kind of thing. Um, how much Water do we have? What, what's the size of the pore spaces? How readily can water flow through this? And what's the volume of water per volume of, of soil or aquifer? We also have fractured bedrock and that could be really any bedrock is not gonna be perfect. It's not like a granite countertop, which is just like a perfect thing, right? There's always gonna be fractures over tens of feet, hundreds of feet. And those fractures are connected and in many cases, we have wells that are in bedrock and you'd have to intersect one of those fractures in order to access the water. And so the web of fractures is what allows the water to trickle down and be stored and also flow through the system. Um, I'm from Florida a little bit, spent five years there. Florida is all on limestone and um, that limestone creates water trickling down from rain um, dissolves the limestone and creates tunnels. So limestone's a really funky um, aquifer that you can actually snorkel in. So we've we've seen different definitions of porosity you know, for aquifers. We use this symbol eta, and it's the volume of the voids over the volume total. In this case, if we have a meter cubed of dry sand, um, the saturated sand the sand becomes saturated when we have um, about 0.3 meters of water. In this case, the porosity is 0.3 cubic meters over the total volume. And so 0.3 is our 
our porosity level. So that's a, a, a thing that we can measure for aquifers. Another term is specific yield and specific retention. Um, let's see here. So specific yield is gonna tell you um, how much water will can, can come out of the aquifer, meaning how much could you actually remove from the aquifer. And this is similar to that field capacity definition. Do you guys remember um, when you wetted soil and then you let the water drain from the field? So you went from saturated to field capacity. Field capacity is basically the specific retention how much water stays behind based on capillary um, suction and specific yield would be that water that drained away by gravity. And so if you add the two up, you get your porosity. In this case, the same specific yield is just the water that can leave that you can actually pump out of the, the aquifer versus what is held behind by the capillary action that a, a normal well wouldn't be able to extract. So we can look these up and, and based on either the texture of the soil or the type of the aquifer, the type of rock it is. Um, porosities range from about 50% down to about 10% for um, bedrock. Specific yield range from about 40% to um, again, eight or 9%, something like that. You can see that for clay, the retention is really high. You're not gonna get a lot of water out of clay. It's gonna hold that water in. You're not gonna be able to use a well to suck the water out of those tiny, tiny pore spaces. Whereas you can see sand doesn't retain a lot of water and you can get some decent water out of it. Some other terms for you guys. Permeability um, and conductivity. And we're gonna use these later to calculate how fast water can flow through aquifers. So permeability is um, little k as um, units of length squared. It's influenced by the grain size um, or the whatever physical characteristics of your aquifer. It can be calculated directly from the grain size and a shape factor. Um, so people can you look at look these up in a table, or you can estimate it indirectly. If you calculate it directly, it's the grain size um, in um, units of length squared times the shape factor. The shape factor is how rounded or pointed the particles are. The conductivity refers to the medium and the fluid. And the properties of the fluid in this case are so that the medium is the permeability value K and the prob prob properties of the fluid refer to is it water oil, something else. In this case, we have the specific gravity, or sorry, the specific weight, gamma. So this is, does anyone remember what the specific weight is? How do we calculate that? I'll ask um, Val on the phone. Isn't it like specific uh, weight of the thing divided by like specific weight of water or something like that? So that's specific gravity. Uh, oh, so that's gamma know. over gamma water. Specific uh, weight, which is just gamma of whatever it is, is the, does anyone remember? Density times gravity. Yep, density times gravity. Um, and then divided by the uh, dynamic viscosity, mu. So as you can imagine how fast water or some liquid flows through an aquifer is gonna be related to its viscosity as well. Why would we care about um, other kinds of viscosity, not just water? Why do we care about other kinds of viscosity? Or how other things flow through aquifers? Oil spills, right? Um, D-napple, L-napple, there's all kinds of crazy chemicals that make their way into the groundwater and flow through. And so we want to know how they flow. Maybe it's uh, sitting on top of the water table or something like that. In this class, we're just going to be talking about water, so don't worry.
So let's just take a look at different hydraulic conductivities. Again, the big K and then the units are length per time. We've got different units here, meters per day or feet per day. We could be on the order of clay or shale. Got a lot of shale on the front range. Got some shale over here, sandstone. Uh, we're talking about orders of magnitude differences here. So maybe it's 10 to the negative six, negative seven for these more consolidated uh, features. Or if it's more sand um, gravels, we could be on the order of um, 10 feet per day. So a really big range of flow rates depending on the aquifer properties. This K value you can measure, um, and we'll talk about how to measure this, or you can look it up, you know, based on what kind of aquifer material it is. It's your calculations of groundwater flow are really sensitive to this K value. This is like the Manning's N for a groundwater flow. We'll use this K value in Darcy's law. I'm gonna introduce it here and we're gonna get into it a little bit more later uh, in the next lecture or two. Darcy's law is a really basic equation. It says the discharge rate is equal to K, our hydraulic conductivity times the surface or the area that we care about. So it's just like a, a unit area, right? Of water flowing some way through an aquifer times the gradient, the hydraulic gradient. And that's the change in head over length. And so the way they're showing it here is, is if you have, if you were to put a um, manometer or something like that in here, you can see that there's a pressure gradient um, that exists from one point to the other. So the change in head over distance to the total slope of the head. The way we would calculate Darcy's law is if you did two wells into a confined aquifer, you could see how high the water raises in those wells over that distance. And that slope is gonna give you that hydraulic gradient for the confined aquifer. For an unconfined aquifer, it's the same thing. It's just that you're looking at the water table elevation. That'll give you that hydraulic gradient. Similar to Manning's equation, you can take the area out and just have velocity is equal to K times the, the slope of the hydraulic gradient. So you divide by area, you get velocity, and you don't need that cross-sectional area. <laughs> this equation assumes that we have laminar flow. That's a pretty good assumption. It's never a good assumption in open channel flow. But for groundwater flow, it's moving so slowly that the water is going to move in a laminar met form, meaning the flow lines are parallel um, uh, within the grains of the aquifer. Can you just define what laminar flow is? Who guys, who remembers what laminar flow is? Isn't it just steady flow? Streamlines don't intersect. It's the, the way we interpret it is really, it's not turbulent flow. The streamlines are parallel. Everything's sliding over each other, kind of like molasses, nice and slow. Um, turbulent flow is when you get vortices. Any kind of airflow is gonna be turbulent because the viscosity is so low. The more viscosity you have, the more resistance to turbulence you have. And so water is kind of in the middle there. Um, steady flow, Edgar, is where the discharge or velocity is not changing with time. Yeah, with time. That's what steady flow refers to. Yeah. <laughs> There's a couple of cases where hydraulics plays a role in this class. That's one of those definitions. This is how Darcy's equation was created or, or found. We, um, Darcy, the scientist and engineer, had a column of sand or different kinds of medium, media, and had some pitot tubes in there, or manometers. We'll just call it manometers. And so this gives you the, the pressure at different points. So the pressure is whatever the water elevation is, hydrostatic pressure. Um, 
we had water flowing in and water coming out. And so Darcy was able to measure that the discharge proportional to the change in H and H was just measured as the difference in the elevation of the water um, at the upstream end and the downstream end. So whatever that change in H was, discharge was proportional to that. Um, so as you crank the flow rate up, if you're imposing the flow rate on the system, you can see that it, it plots linearly with, with this change, this difference in, um, in H's. You also saw that it's proportional to the area. So you could have different uh, diameters of columns that the water flows to. And he saw that it was proportional to the inverse of the length. So as the length increased, the discharge went down. So if you put all those together, um, you're able to come up with this equation. So the delta H over delta L, um, the cross-sectional area, and then to get from a proportionality to an equality, we have to have a factor. So proportional means it's linearly related to, we don't know how exactly that is. And so that's where K comes in. And K can be calculated based on this experiment. You have L, delta H and area. You can com control for all these variables and then calculate K. Very similar to how we calculated the Weir coefficient in hydraulics, although we didn't get to actually do that because of COVID. <laughs> so let's talk about head a little bit more. In an unconfined aquifer, the head in that term is just the elevation of the water table. In a confined aquifer setting, it's the it's the head of the it's the elevation of the water table plus the pressure in the system. So this is pressure over gamma. Gamma again is specific weight, rho times g. So if we've got two wells. In this case, we have an unconfined aquifer. Here's the ground of the surface of the ground right here. We've got a well and we've measured the depth of water from the top of the well casing down to the groundwater. We did that over here too. And we're able to say, okay, the difference in elevation between these two is uh, in this case, three meters, right? And we know the distance between these wells. And so we can use that, all of that to, um, look at the change in, in um, the hydraulic gradient between these two wells. And in this case, because it's unconfined, it's just the potential energy from gravity. But in a confined aquifer, now we're looking at the pressure as well. So I'm going to do, introduce the concepts right now. We'll actually do some calculations next time. Another thing we can do, another tool we can do with wells is um, we can estimate flow rates and hydraulic conductivities between these wells and estimate properties of the aquifer. We can also determine the um, direction of flow. So let's look at how we might do that. We've got well one here and the head is 26 meters. And so this has been converted to some elevation, some arbitrary elevation, 26.2 uh, here and then 26.26. And so if you've got this differential elevation with these wells, um, we can actually get a gradient in a flow direction. And um, and you need more than, than two points, right? If we have two points we can say, okay, well, the water would be flowing from the higher one to the lower one. We don't actually know that water is flowing in this particular direction. With three of them, you can actually figure that out um, by drawing essentially ISO, um, I don't know what they're called exactly, but the, the, the topography or isobars, sorry, contours that would reflect the elevation of the water similar to what we did with the rainfall rain gauge maps. And so people can do that if you have a big system of wells, you can end up drawing contours of elevation. In this case, this is the elevation of the groundwater. And so the surface might be doing like this up and down, 
the groundwater is going to do its own thing. It's going to be influenced by topography, but it's not totally connected to topography. And then similar to um, just uh, topographic contour lines, the water flows perpendicular to those contour lines. It's going to go along the steepest gradient. And so this is showing a map then showing the um, direction of groundwater flow in this system. So that's a look at groundwater in space. Groundwater also is influenced by time. And what you're seeing is, is a well log. Um, let's see. Oh, sorry, this is a stream flow log. We'll look at a well log, I think, later. Um, and so it's just showing, you know, you get a storm, it comes back down, a peak flow it comes back down. And what they've done is they've basically connected all the bases of those hydrographs so here's the surface runoff, which is what we've calculated in the last section. And here's the base flow. And so the base flow is coming up, it's going down, it's coming up, it's going down. And so if we just connect the bases of all those runoff hydrographs, we can kind of estimate what the base flow is. And this is related to the elevation of the water table near the creek. And so you can see the water table is being recharged and then discharging and then recharging and discharging. And it gets its lowest in this time of the year, and it comes back up and gets recharged in this time of the year. Another kind of groundwater that is, it's kind of like not groundwater, it is groundwater. It's called the hyporheic zone. So hypo means below, rheic or rios refers to river, below the river. And if we have uh, relatively permeable layers like alluvial sediment, sand, gravel, cobble around the river that the river is deposited, then we can have essentially this zone where water can leave the river, enter this near river zone, the groundwater, and then come back into the river um, over short and longer path lengths. There's also what these little smiley faces are is where channels used to exist. So over long periods of time, the river is moving across the floodplain where it deposits coarser sediment in the channel, creates preferential flow paths. And those flow paths can be still connected to the river. So maybe there's a historic channel over here and it's got coarser cobble and boulder material and it's able to draw water through that in a preferential way. Kind of like those macro pores we talked about in soil and sediment. What is it called? Paleo channels. So channels that used to exist a long time ago and the rivers moved away from them, or maybe the, move, the rivers deposited and risen relative to them. So what this is, is a lateral and vertical connection between the river and the groundwater. Um, Water can leave and enter a cross section in the banks or the bed. If we look at a pool riffle kind of sequence, water can enter at the top of the riffle and come out downstream in a pool. It can also cut across a meander bend. So if this is a big point bar or meander, the water can flow through this slowly and then come out later. This is just another look at that. You've got water entering the riffle and coming out in the pool. You could also have the valley scale where water enters the groundwater at the upstream end of a valley. And then maybe that valley closes off again and gets pinched off in a canyon and the groundwater comes out and upwells down here. We can measure this hyperreic zone and this exchange of water using piezometers, these little pipes we put in the ground. And sometimes there's um, an upwelling, kind of like a little tiny artesian aquifer it's not artesian because it's not confined, but there's a bigger pressure relative to the surrounding area and water can actually come up into this piezometer, this little well, and tell you that there's positive pressure, water is coming out of the bed or negative pressure, water is going into the bed. And that's what's called vertical hydraulic gradient. If you pound this piezometer into the, the ground, if if it's um, positive, meaning water's coming up above um, the water surface, then you have positive head and water is upwelling. 
or if it's below the water surface, that means you have downwelling. This has an ecological importance. Um, bugs can actually live in the hyperreg zone. The hyperreg zone has a different temperature and nutrient regime. It can be important for fish. For example, salmon were found to make their nests more preferentially in upwelling zones, like at the bottom of riffles or the bottom of valleys, where that's where the water had a more consistent temperature for this fish. They can also be refuges from extremes for example, I'm working on a research project right now where we're tracking um, if you can restore those hyperreic pathways by certain river restoration techniques, um, getting more water into side channels and on the floodplain. Can we infiltrate more water into the sediment, to the groundwater, the hyperreic zone, and have it come out later? Maybe it's cooler during the summertime or warmer during the wintertime. Here's an example of what that looks like. This is a river that was um, restored, meaning it was realigned. It was a channelized river up against one side of the valley. They went in and um, changed the, the shape of the channel and installed some features and reconnected the river to its floodplain and some of these old historic channels that used to exist there. They excavated into this area to create what's called an alcove. It's just like a deep pocket that's connected by the surface to the main channel. And the, the hope was is that there's a, an old channel here that you can see that's been abandoned. The hope was is that this old channel would be a preferential flow path for water to move across this meander bend and come out here cooler during the summer months. So maybe the time frame for water to move through this, this area is on the order of weeks or months versus the you know, hours it takes for water to move through the channel. And a temperature sensor here in this alcove versus the main channel showed a big difference. So the blue is the temperature sensor in the alcove and the green is the temperature sensor in the main channel. And you can see during the summer months, this is June, July, August, September, October, that the water stayed a lot cooler and didn't have these big up and down fluctuations that the main channel water had. So if this temperature right here is 16 degrees Celsius, this is where salmon start to become really um, stressed physiologically and they're endangered species of salmon that live in this system. If they're able to access this alcove, that hyperreic flow um, might be an area where they could seek refuge from those hot extreme temperatures. So you see the seasonal buffering in the alcove. You also see a diurnal buffering. The average temperature might not be different. It might be a little bit lower, but it might not be different on average but it doesn't have the extreme uprises and falls that the main stem water has. So they went through and excavated that out? Yeah, yeah. The idea was to tie back in to that hyperreic flow and to let it have an outlet. So you're surfacing that hyperreic realm quicker than it was. Right, you're, you're creating a space for it to pool and to collect and not mix with the main flow that's just going quickly this way. Otherwise it might seep out in the bank and be really diffuse and there might not be an area that it collects for the fish. Another um, concept that we'll talk about and actually calculate is this idea of a cone of depression. If we put a well in an aquifer and start pumping water out of it, noted, denoted as Q, the water is gonna start to go down um, and to create this cone of depression all around it. So if I had a well right here nearby, the groundwater level and that well will go down. Also, it changes the flow lines and water starts to flow towards the well. This is really important. Say I had a septic system over here. I wanna make sure that my cone of depression isn't gonna get the groundwater near that septic system and start causing that leachate to come towards my well. It also plays out with confined aquifers, except that cone of depression is really imaginary and related to the piezometric head or the potentiometric surface. Meaning if I were to put a well here, the water, artesian water would only rise up to this imaginary cone of depression. So is the aquifer down in the San Luis Valley confined or unconfined? Aquifer? Yeah, um, let's see, do I have? We're gonna talk about that in a second, oh, okay. yeah. It's a mix. Um, 
this plays out in groundwater subsidence. This is a map of Houston, Texas. So here's Houston, here's the Gulf of Mexico. When you start draining water out of a system, and especially in a confined aquifer setting, you can think of that water as piers that are pushing up the confined layer. The water in that pressure is, is basically keeping that aquifer being, being compressed. When you take that water out, the confined aquifer can be compressed and consolidate more um, from the weight of everything above. And so what this is showing is the subsidence and feet that has occurred and faults that have also occurred. So they're getting earthquakes um, as a result of subsidence. They're pumping the groundwater out of the system and everything's sinking. This can be bad news for a drainage situations. You don't wanna be lower and create areas of depression because then it rains and water collects. Louisiana is experiencing this too. They're getting subsidence from um, different reasons though. Yeah. Kind of building off of that, how is there's a city, I can't remember the name of it, but the city in the United States that's below sea level? New Orleans. Death Valley. How is that even possible that they're not full of water? They have a lot of pumps. They do? Yeah. Really? They've got these pumps that are two stories tall. They're wild. And they have all these drainage canals that collect that water and they pump it out and put it in the Mississippi and all the other surrounding water bodies. <laughs> Talk to the people 400 years ago. <laughs> you know, it was a massive port back in the day. Mm -hmm. Levees, seawalls, yeah. No, thank you. No, thank you. So environmental, we talked about how they reintroduce water, like in California, and can go to the Why don't they do that as well? They might be able to. I don't know how, you know, with a confined system, that water is usually coming from somewhere else farther away. The recharge zone for the confined system is somewhere else. And so you'd have to work on that. I don't know if you can reverse it because once something's cranked down, you've got to push back up, right? And I don't know if you can reinflate, so to speak, the confined aquifer. This might be irreversible. It can be slowed down. Yeah, exactly. Let's look at the San Luis Valley, home of uh, Colorado's potato country. I think Idaho owns potatoes. Well, Colorado has a lot of potatoes too. And obviously there's a lot of irrigation here. Most of this is groundwater fed irrigation. You do have the Rio Grande right here. And so that does supply some surface water, um, but the vast majority of this is groundwater. And that groundwater is coming from the Sangre de Cristos primarily, although you do have some, you know, groundwater systems coming from the San Juan mountains as well on the other side of the valley. So here's just a look at the San Luis Valley um, in terms of where you have recharge and discharge. We're looking north this way, Sangre de Cristo mountains. And um, you've got this big filled area of just this, this sediment. Um, you've got some confining layers that are coming off the mountains. And so you've got recharge happening from snow melts um, that's going into those confined layers. And so there are artesian um, wetlands. This is a big um, wetland area, or at least it was historically. There's some wetlands that are still preserved that are really important for sandhill cranes. And those wetlands are just sitting in the middle of the San Luis Valley. There's no surface water connection. It's all artesian water coming up, supplying those wetlands. Um, and then the irrigation is pumping water out. That's where you see these blue lines coming up of the system. Um, let's see. This is a, just a map of the potentiometric surface of the aquifer in the San Luis Valley. Um, 
trying to see if you can tell where, where is artesian, where is not. There's certain areas that are artesian and it's closer to the mountain range where you have those confining layers still. And then once you get down the basin, it might still be confined and you might still have some artesian, but not necessarily like coming all the way out. This is a look at the change in storage in that aquifer. You can think of this really as just a depth, depth over time. How high is the water table or that aquifer over time? And this is starting in 1980 all the way to 2020. An article from High Country News. Um, you guys will read about this and, and get to um, write about it a little bit in your homework. As you can see, there's a big downward trend, unfortunately, and that's kind of the picture for every type of water resource we have. Um, and each year you can see how it's kind of drawn down, then it comes back up, it's drawn down, it comes back up. So there's a, an annual recharge that happens, but that annual recharge is only so much and it's not going to offset these really big withdrawals. 2002, there's a really big drought. Um, when there's a really big drought, you draw more water. There's more evapotranspiration, there's less surface water coming into supplement. So the aquifer took a big hit and they were starting to build it back up. They had a local voluntary program for people to either fallow and get paid to fallow their fields or to cut back on their irrigation. They slowly built it back up. And then we had another drought, built it back up slowly, and then another drought. <laughs> so it's been hard, it's been hard and it keeps going down. And unfortunately the state is um, threatening to step in and kind of put restrictions on how much people can pump if it keeps going down below certain levels. <laughs> What's that? I don't know how much they take, not as much as alfalfa. I know alfalfa is the biggest consumer, corn's another big consumer. I think hemp and marijuana is a little bit lower usage, but I don't know that, that total answer there. Um, so do the, uh, the sand dunes down there, do they play a big role in uh, natural uh, artesian placement? The sand, the, a lot of the, um, let's see if we can take a look. It flows through it so nicely rather than being pushed down and then have to come up. Yeah. How do I get a new tab here? Yeah, in a way, in a way, yes. Um, let's do Alamosa. I've never been to the sand dunes down there. It's a cool, this is a beautiful area. There's some good hot springs. I'm just gonna tell you right now. Crestone's a funky little town. Um, Cottonwood. There's two hot springs. One's in the valley. It's called Valley View. Might be a little bit farther up here. Um, and you're sitting in one of these wetlands. Is that it right there? That might be it. I don't know. Um, and then there's one up here called, um, no, that one up here is called Valley View. Anyway, there's some beautiful ones. There's one up here hanging up. Really nice. Um, the dunes. Were, yeah, there we go, Joyful Journey, and then Valley View. Yeah, Joyful Journey. <laughs> and it's sitting in there in one of those wetland areas. And Valley View is kind of way up here. The way it works is that you get um, recharge into some confined layers that carries the water deep below. And that's what people tap into for artesian. And then you get these um, alluvial fans right here that we looked at in uh, that flooding class. So these are all fans that are coming out and then the creeks come out and recharge the surface water here. A lot of these creeks just disappear. That's kind of funky. You can follow this creek and it just kind of goes and goes and goes and then it terminates in what's really just like a big wetland area. Um, so there's the surface water contribution that comes from this and then there's the groundwater and, it, and the artesian 
that goes underground from the mountains. And it all kind of mixes here. In some cases, the artesian comes up and creates these wetlands. In some cases, people tap down with their wells to access that. UFO watchtowers. UFO watchtowers. A lot of funky stuff out there, guys. It's a cool area. But this creek, if you go to the sand dunes, it's, uh, I think it's at Cottonwood Creek, Madonna Creek. Um, this is a creek that flows over the sand dunes. You can see it's all wet right there from the creek. It's a really funky creek. Um, and then it typically just disappears. It just goes into the sand and um, eventually reappears <laughs> downstream at the end of all that. Yeah, that's a really cool system. Yeah. All right, so we will, um, I'll take any questions if you guys have them on either the floodplain homework or the project. Um, we'll talk about doing some calculations. We will do some calculations related to Darcy's equation, and aquifer stuff on Thursday. What's that? Yeah. Um, and then I'll, I'll drop the homework on Thursday for groundwater. That'll be our last homework. So we have a homework assignment for groundwater. We've got the last project assignment, which I'll talk about as well. And um, come down to the wire. Are those due next week? Both of those? I think I have the groundwater due the last week of classes and the project, the final project I have due before Thanksgiving. Which is next week, right? Yeah. Oh, so you're going to move that homework that's due on Tuesday? Let's see here. So I think you had like a homework and a project due next week. It's possible. Let's take a look. It's just kind of freaking me out. I don't want you to freak out, Edgar. I'm um, freaking, I'm um, freaked out, Joel. <laughs> I, can, I can tell in your tone. Yeah. This is, this is Edgar freaking out. <laughs> it's, all, it's all just simmering below the surface. Uh, where's my calendars here? There it is. Bye, guys. Visualize more circles. More circles? Dude. Oh, is that materials or is that geotech? That's geotech. Don't you guys have a, a protractor? <laughs> Maybe you can do it with um, like uh, create circles in PowerPoint or something. Do you have to measure all that though? Yeah. And I don't know, it's just to draw like visual, which which visualize. Yeah, I hear that. We've got homework seven due this Friday. Okay, homework eight groundwater. And then the project. I guess I can move groundwater to The third, so yeah. Cool. And also, um, you see how it's like the guest lecture and then the reflection paper, are those two? Did I make two assignments? I think I think you did. I did the day one. I didn't do that one. Okay. Are they, uh, are they I'll supposed to be the same assignment? Yeah, I, th I, I forgot I already posted this. Okay. Let me just, um, I'll go combine those. Oh, and also, can we write 